And we move on now to the final panel session, and that is on financial sector vision and strategy, the agenda for the next five years. As the financial sector continues to be a cornerstone for economic growth and investment, both India and the United States must focus on innovation, regulatory frameworks, and inclusive financial practices to drive the next wave of growth. I would like to introduce the panelists one by one, please, and request you to please come up on stage. Dr. Deepesh Sah, Executive Director at IFSCA, Gift City. Dr. Deepesh Shah. Mr. Alex Mosaski, Chairman International at Marsh McLennan. Bishakha Bhattacharya, Vice President for Public Policy at AWS. And Rajesh Kumar, Managing Director and CEO of TransUnion Sybil. The session will be moderated by Mr. R.G. Manalak, Senior Vice President and Head of APAC FinTech Sales at NASDAQ. Ladies and gentlemen, I request all of you to please settle down. Our panelists, Dr. Deepesh Shah, Alex Mozaski, Bishaka Bhattacharya, Rajesh Kumar are here. R.G. Manulak, Senior Vice President and Head of APAC FinTech Sales at NASDAQ is the moderator. I request all of you to please give a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> Welcome the panelists and the moderator. Mr. Manulak, I hand over the session to you. Thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to be here. I know we're coming towards the end of the day. Uh, for me in particular, uh, so my name is R.G. Manulak. I, I, I run the FinTech business uh, in Asia for NASDAQ. Many of, you, many of you probably don't, aren't aware that NASDAQ is a key technology provider. Most know it as, as traditional exchange, but more and more, we've been really providing a lot of critical technologies to the financial ecosystem. So very relevant to today's discussion. I always find it super refreshing coming to uh, summits like these. Oftentimes when I'm at conferences, it's always just finance guys, and it's, it ends up being pretty boring, to be honest. So thank you very much for all of your, your, your ideas and your, your sharing today. It's been really uh, productive for me. So we have, uh, I think, a very informative uh, discussion today with a very diverse uh, set of panelists who I'll let introduce themselves shortly. But just to set the scene a little bit, so a little over a month ago, I think the Minister of Finance issued the union budget uh, for the next year uh, for India, which obviously spread across many different industries. But one, of, one particular thing they, they, they pointed out uh, within that was the fact that they're going to be issuing a, a, a strategic document uh, in the near future really outlining the financial sector vision and strategy uh, preparing the sector for, for the future in the next five years in terms of size, capacity, skills, and so forth. And so we really wanted to take the opportunity today with, with uh, the panelists we have to really discuss maybe what uh, in our ideal minds would, would be contained in that, in that document uh, for the future in terms of how it might best impact our, our industries here. And so we're looking forward to discussing that. Before we get there, though, I, I, I wanted to quickly comment on, I know we've heard a lot about the year 2047 today. Uh, in terms of the goals of India uh, reaching a, uh, a prosperous and inclusive India by that date. My, my background, I've, I've spent most of my career in Hong Kong, uh, in Asia, for 14 years. And that, that date is also significant for Hong Kong, for, th for those of you who know, 2047 is when is the end of the one country, two systems uh, policy in Hong Kong after the handover of 1997. And so I, I think it, the, the dichotomy is very interesting in a sense that Hong Kong has always been a financial superpower and sort of moving back towards a very different uh, environment in 2047. And India, you can see, is using the, the, the lead of democracy to move towards a very open and, and, and uh, developing market. And so not saying anything good or bad about either one. It's just very, very uh, interesting to see both, both sides of things. And we'll see where they, where they end up. But uh, either way, very interesting. So before we get started, I'll let uh, the panelists introduce themselves. Maybe I'll start with uh, Mr. Dupesh over here, a uh, quick introduction, and then we can pass it on. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Dipesha, Executive Director, Development at the International Financial Services Center Authority, which is India's maiden international financial center setting up an inbound and outbound gateway for a lot of foreign investments coming into India and going out of India. Uh, hi. Uh, good evening. I'm Rajesh. I, I head uh, TransUnion Civil in India. Prior to this, I used to head risk at a large bank. <laughs> Hi, uh, Alex Petrowski, Martian McLennan. I'm the international chairman. 
Uh, we're basically four brands, Marsh, Guy Carpenter, Mercer, and Oliver Wyman. Been involved in India for 20 years from the very beginning. Uh, as far as insurance broking is concerned, very excited about the future here. Good evening, Bishakha Bhattacharya. I'm from Amazon Web Services, a global cloud service provider, and uh, thank you for having us. Great. So, so maybe just to set, set the stage a bit, um, I, I think all of you probably had a bit of a read of the union budget in terms of what, what, the, what that means. Uh, based on your, your part of the sector, what do you think is the most promising takeaways from what's happened in the past year in India? And, and also, what do you think would be uh, sort of needs more clarity in the future, in the coming year uh, within the financial sector? Maybe I'll start with uh, Alex. And the sector. I'm actually very excited because if you look at what's been going on at the IRDA, at the uh, regulator and the new chairman Panda, he's, he's been a sort of maverick. It's been, it's been uh, very exciting. He's, he's, his, his view about the future of uh, insurance and everyone insured by 2047 is, is um, tangible. And uh, you know, I, I mentioned yesterday that uh, when I, on, on uh, Chat GPT, uh, the uh, the lady who speaks to me was telling me that we uh, that we could have a larger insurance industry here than we do in the U.S. Uh, by 2047. And I do think that we're on our way. There's some things that we would like to see, um, but there's clarity. Uh, both, you can tell that the government what is looking is planning long term. You can tell that it's talking about ease of doing business. Um, we would like a more level playing field for, for international insurance brokers. We'd like to see 100% uh, FDI in insurance companies. We'd like to see freer flow of, um, of reinsurance backwards and forwards to the you know, to different international markets and also coming into, into India. But all in all, pretty excited. That's no, crazy here. And I, I can, it's certainly from my perspective, we, we tackle mainly the banking industry and the brokerage industry, but certainly as well in India, we've seen a lot of activity from the regulator uh, RBI also, more so in the last couple of years, to hopefully, again, energize that space. Yeah, hopefully and, it's not a hallucination. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I, I think hopefully that's a, it's a common, common ground across all industries as well. So that's great to see. Um, Rajesh, how about from the credit, credit space? How, what are you seeing? Yeah. Since I represent uh, TransUnion Sibyl, I'm going to come at this topic from the world of uh, retail credit. Right. So first things first, I think it's been well established. When we, when we talk about uh, the vision of uh, Vixit Bharat for 2047, it's first important to, first of all, understand the correlation between retail credit growth and GDP growth and uh, in turn the per capita income, right? And, and it's been established over the last 20 years in India that typically retail credit has a cause and effect relationship with GDP growth and it's, it's between a 2x and 3x. So that's the, that's the importance of uh, access to credit and financial inclusion when we talk about Vixit Bharat, first of all. And then a few quick numbers to set the context and the importance of uh, access to credit and financial inclusion. So as all of us know, in, in India we're talking about uh, more than 300 million young population who are below the age of uh, 20. We're talking about 460 million uh, women borrowers uh, women who, who could be eligible for credit, and then we're talking about 64 million uh, small businesses, MSMEs, and about uh, 146 million farmers, right, including small and marginal farmers. These are huge numbers, but if you look at the actual credit active population in this huge population within each segment, be it young, uh, uh, young population or the small businesses, currently we are at 15 to 20 percent or in terms of credit penetration. It's as low as 15 to 20%. And, and as important to understand that we have reached this 15 to 20% after double digit growth last five years, which means we have grown more than 2x in terms of uh, credit penetration into this population, and we're still at 15 to 20%. So this, is just, this just goes to establish how much more headroom we have. This just goes to establish the importance of retail credit and access, easy access to uh, credit and financial inclusion. And, and uh, I think as we talk about a strategy document, I think it's going to be an important pillar in terms of enabling that uh, vision. And what do we do as a system in terms of uh, the uh, the regulations, the policies, the available digital ecosystem, etc. 
That sounds like clearly a lot of opportunity there. So oh yeah, huge opportunity. To see. So Bishaka, I think you offer you you're able to offer a slightly different perspective uh, given your role at AWS. I'm, I'm curious how you how you see AWS sort of and, and the cloud playing a part in in the government's vision here within finance. Thanks so much uh, for that. You know, if you look at the budget uh, announcements and overall the strategy that the government is adopting, I think almost for over the last decade, it is, uh, you know, commitment to uh, leverage technology for growth, for, for development. And I think that is where, you know, cloud service providers come in. India has set an example on how you leverage, you know, digital public infrastructure for population scale citizen services and population scale in India is unmatched, right? And, uh, you know, the scalability, the reliability of cloud services is actually enabling and uh, powering some of uh, these citizen services. And if you look at even, you know, financial sector, for instance, um, uh, you know, uh, we just spoke about access to credit. Um, I think just uh, the fact that, uh, you know, financial, the fintech sector in India has been innovating in a tremendous space. And uh, what cloud does, what cloud enables, is innovation at scale with, with you know, little or no penalty for failure because you can experiment, you can uh, launch uh, products, and you can also fail fast and pivot. So it is the flexibility and agility that is um, actually empowering the builders in India, in, um, in, in this sector and overall. And I think, uh, you know, this overall, uh, you know, the cloud characteristics that a cloud has to offer, which is scalability, agility, flexibility, and democratizing access to technology, I think it's like a match made in heaven in some ways. That was great. Just as a quick follow-up, maybe, and again, uh, more of a curious question for myself. How do you find India's sort of uh, policies around data uh, sovereignty uh, impacting sort of cloud's uh, influence in, in, in India's finance sector? Is that loosening? Is it still sort of in the middle? I'm just curious what your views are. There. So from a policy perspective, the last two years have been very hectic, and we've had some very amazing progressive um, outsourcing guidelines that the RBI, for instance, has released, which is clearly acknowledges, uh, you know, a risk-based approach, uh, which is, you know, if you, the, the regulated entities essentially decide uh, what data they want to put um, outsource and put it out in different systems, including cloud. So for the first time last year, the, the financial sector, uh, the outsourcing guidelines acknowledge that uh, the regulated industry, the financial sector industry will build on cloud. And they already have put out certain guardrails, uh, which is uh, which are amazing. I mean, they talk about risk base, they talk about um, uh, you know um, uh, safeguards that you can follow, and leave a lot to you know the the companies, the regulated entities to decide. And that flexibility, I think, uh, is again uh, very very welcome. That's great to hear. So shifting gears a bit, I want to talk to, to, to Dr. Shah here about. Uh, so the, the budget obviously outlined a number of different uh, initiatives to attract investments to uh, IFSCs, International Financial Services Center. And so uh, how do you see, uh, maybe give us an update on what, how Gift City is doing in terms of currently, and how do you see the, the, the future vision for Gift Cities playing a part in, 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 in their vision? Sure. I think, RG, you really outlined the 2047 very well in your opening remarks. And I think three, four data points are very important from an India perspective. So we are talking of more than 7.5% in growth for next 20 plus years. We are talking of the per capita income going to 9x to go to 22,000 US dollar by 2047. And we are talking of an exports which will be around 9, 8 trillion by 2047. And then we are talking of a net zero transition financing of almost 10 trillion dollar required. With these numbers, what does it present? presents a huge opportunity that India presents to the global institutions. And in order to ensure that we are able to capitalize on this opportunity, obviously India can't rely on the smaller financial centers outside. You can't rely on, say, how Dubai is going to finance me, or how Singapore is going to finance me, or how Mauritius is going to invest in my opportunities. You have to create your own platform, which will not only give you the right set of uh, institutions, of doing, providing those services and also create large number of jobs. And that's what we are seeing the gift city emerging from that perspective that you exported businesses and you exported jobs because you did not
create the regulatory environment and the tax competitive regime which would be suitable for those businesses. And that's what now GIFT is trying to address. And, and, and our experience in last 10 years or so, I think from a concept to a reality, I, obviously the concept stage, everybody said in the similar type of the room that this can't happen. You know, what you are trying to do is against the views. But if we see fast forward to what is happening in 2024, we have more than 700 firms now operating in the GIFT city and uh, several U.S. institutions uh, present in GIFT now, including players like Bank of America and IBM and Google and Oracle. They all are doing large number of transactions, including JP Morgan and uh, <coughs> likes of Morgan Stanley and Citibank. They all operating their financial institutions and businesses within the GIFT ecosystem for India and outside. And what we could see now is a change and probably uh, two systems, as you rightly said uh, in your beginning opening comments, that now India has two systems. One, you have domestic India, where you have four financial regulators regulating the domestic zone, and you have an international financial services center, where you have a separate unified regulator with an offshore status granted to an onshore center. That has really changed the whole equation in the way the foreign institutions are now able to participate in the larger India opportunities. And I have a friend here, Ed, who always reminds me, how can you remove the friction in the systems? And probably GIFT is trying to address how do we remove the friction for the institutions which wants to come and invest into India and make GIFT as probably a platform where they are closer to the market, they get a similar tax competitive advantage which they are used to, and create large number of jobs with a very competitive uh, and skilled manpower available within the Indian ecosystem now. That's great to hear. I mean, it sounds like obviously Gift City is still very much developing. For yeah. the panelists, how, how do you see it impacting your business? No, I just, um, so obviously there are choices. So Dubai and, and, other, and other areas. So the, your, your long-term structure as well as your competitiveness is really important. One of the things that you know, I, I'm particularly interested in is, first of all, I'm a big believer that insurance is the lubricants of the economy. You have a strong insurance, uh, industry, you have investment, you have people making decisions, taking risk, being protected, individuals, etc. So it's really, really important. One of the most important parts of it is reinsurance and capital. And, and I worry a little bit that, the, that there may be, with what you are offering in, 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 in the gift city, may actually be um, detrimental to the overall growth of reinsurance in India, where I don't think there should be, I think there should be similar or, or like um, conditions and rights for reinsurance because it's so important. So I think, yeah, certainly, you know, I, I, I admire what you're doing, but I, but I would like you to kind of look at reinsurance and perhaps see it in a different light because there is, a, we're seeing some moves that would favor Gift City but I think at the detriment of the average consumer in India. I think point, point went well taken. See, the, for the financial center in GIFT, the policy orientation has to be more outward oriented. Uh, you can't benchmark GIFT with the domestic policy because that's not the objective. You're, you're creating a financial center which is obviously creating an offshore environment. And what are those offshore environments? You go to Dubai, you go to Singapore, Policies are not in your hand. It is created by the regulators outside in the way that they want for those entities to do India business sitting in those centers. So within GIFT, if you have to be competitive, you have to ensure that you give a level playing field to the institutions who are used to operate outside. You have to do some policy changes which may or may not be in line with what is going on in the domestic market in the domestic India. So you will always have those type of, uh, you know, what you call the policy call which the government and the regulators have to take. But we have to see the larger picture. The larger picture is, do you want people to come from those outside financial centers and serve you? Yes, you want, but you also want to create your own financial center where people can come and create those jobs. So I want to I shift gears and talk a bit about the regulatory landscape. I know we've mentioned a little bit about it now. NASDAQ, at NASDAQ, we're super focused on helping our clients ensure compliance within uh, regulatory requirements, market uh, compliance, and things like that. So I'm curious, uh, you know, India's obviously always been quite complex in terms of regulatory body. Um, I'm curious, Rajesh, you mentioned, you know, some of the, the growth challenges to date. 
How, how do you feel that the regulatory environment is, uh, is helping or harming that uh, so far? I think if, if you really look at the geopolitical situation and the huge growth opportunity here and the exponential growth of the use of data and technology, I think uh, regulations become super important. The regulators play a very important role to ensure stability, security, and sustainable growth. So I think uh, as far as our business is concerned, we've had a very constructive and collaborative uh, relationship with the regulators. We, we see complaints to these regulations as an important pillar to make our business model stronger and stronger. Uh, yes, th there are, there are uh, sometimes challenges in terms of quickly living up to expectations, but I think the, I think the uh, good news is that uh, between, between uh, such rapid growth and ensuring safety, it's a right uh, bridge to ensure the balance. And lastly, I think uh, for, from our perspective, uh, within the organization at Sibyl, it's really about uh, ensuring uh, compliance is an everyday culture. And, and most importantly, I think it's just about embedding a culture of risk management into everyday processes. That's an evolution, but uh, I think it's been an interesting journey, and I'm sure all of this will help us grow even stronger and towards that Vixit Bharat of 2047. Yeah, yeah I, I would add that, um, to, and, and, and again, I'm really impressed by the direction that the insurance regulator is taking us. Uh, if you're focused on the well-being of the consumer, you're focused on transparency and focused on you know, modernization uh, as well as evaluation and, and audit. I think we're in good shape. But let's keep the client, let's be client-centric as, uh, as we make our rules. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, so look, I think um, we've been talking all about the, the, the great potential and the opportunities. Nothing this transformational can happen without risks as well. I want to talk a little bit about that also. I think it's important to strike a balance between harnessing the power of, of, of technology uh, with protecting, obviously, the business and, and, and the market as well. Uh, maybe, Bishaka, you can start. Uh, in terms of how uh, the cloud service providers like yourselves play a role in terms of meeting the challenge of ensuring safety and security in the marketplace, what is your view on, on India's uh, status there so far? That's such a great question, and maybe we can spend hours talking about it, but I know the time constraints. <laughs> we have, we have um, eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, eight minutes for everybody, so I, I'm not looking at the countdown here. But, um, you know, uh, interestingly, um, Honorable uh, Prime Minister, I think a few, few days back uh, when he addressed the fintech sector, talked about um, how cybersecurity would, uh, you know, define uh, the success of, uh, of you know, fintech in India. Uh, it's so it's so critical and foundational, uh, you know, for um, of, uh, f just just for the, the sector to succeed, but also for financial inclusion, right? So, um, you know, as a cloud service provider, as AWS, um, you know, we, of course, our cloud is used by governments, enterprises, startups for sensitive data, for top secret data. So, um, you know, the way at least we approach it, um, it's not just a technology response. It is, it is holistic. We, have, we approach it in, across, you know, multiple uh, pillars. One is organizational. As an organization, you know, we believe that security is everyone's responsibility. So while, you know, definitely there is a technology response, but every function has a security, uh, you know, KPI. Um, and, uh, and this is actually foundational for us because it is also called, uh, you know, uh, priority zero, which is over and above <laughs> one. Uh, so that's how foundational security is in the in the psyche of the organization. But you know, coming to um, the 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 technology response, which is also extremely critical, because we need to not only secure uh, the infrastructure on which some of these innovations are being built on, but also provide those tools and ability to our customers to secure their applications, their data, and uh, and 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 the mental model as we build is, I'm sorry, there is another zero here, <laughs> but it's zero trust, which means that you just can't trust anybody. It has to be a system of minimum privileges. Um, you know, there are uh, multiple security layers, defense layers that you build in so that you can, uh, you know, fight any, any breach at multiple layers. And each layer is successively specialized, making it more difficult so that there is no one single point of failure that, you know, if one is breached, you're 
out. And, and this is, uh, this then feeds into how our services are designed. Um, we also respond to customers, uh, you know, systems as they, as they develop, you know. For instance, if we look at the financial sector, it's a no-brainer that there will be, I mean, majority of finance, uh, finance, financial institutions will actually have multiple deployments. They will have some on-prem, some on the cloud, some legacy systems. I mean, it's going to be a it's going to be a mix match uh, hybrid system and it's important for us to secure some of those and those become a challenge so there again there is a technology solution which we all, not just us but you know what becomes important is therefore to enable the customer to be able uh, to you know secure it across all these deployments even if it's not on aws for instance right so so what we have are called observability services which allows you to ingest uh, security data from various sources, and and then you you plan for it, you react to it, you basically monitor it, you just simplify the complex uh, you know deployments that you have, and uh, and one of the important things that made this possible is industry collaboration. So there is a standard development where you know as industry we've gotten together, we've developed an open schema framework for uh, you know seamless sharing of cybersecurity information, whether it's threat intelligence, whether it's incident reports, or even you know compromise of uh, you know incidents. You're not sure, but so and you know so all of this makes. Uh, is just helping us make it happen. Look, security is not a destination, it's a journey. You just have to be, have to be at it. And finally, I know I've taken time, but finally, one of the main things that, that's important is, um, uh, is skilling and helping people architect securely, which we take very seriously. Skilling, of course, you know, providing cybersecurity specialized certifications on AWS, but otherwise, and, um, you know, guiding our customers with well-architected framework on the security pillar. So that's a complete holistic picture. I think there's a role here for insurance as well in that you know, the, the exposures that you're acquiring with uh, um, generative AI, are extensions of existing risks that just make it more complicated, and then you mix those or converge those with some of the um, reality, mixed reality technologies, you've got, you've got quite an interesting um, problem. And if each insurance jurisdiction comes up with its own policy wording, uh, I think it'll be a mistake. And I think we sort of globally need to think about standards for, you know, PI cover and and uh, for protecting IP and so on. So it's a it's it's a, it's a big deal, but it shouldn't get in the way of progress. Now, all, all valid points. I think you know you you mentioned obviously security. You mentioned Gen AI. Uh, I want to segue right into that topic, given it's, it's on the title here. So I want to make sure we get to that point of, of, of AI and how it applies to the financial sector. I think security is, uh, from an ASA perspective, security is a key aspect of where AI is going to fit, right? So financial crime comes with all financial progress in many ways. Unfortunately, these days, it seems to be a, a huge topic. Um, and so that's where we're, we are seeing the, 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 maybe the, the best use case for, for AI right now is to basically identify where financial crime going to happen before it happens. I'm curious what else other panelists are seeing in terms of maybe where AI might apply to your businesses uh, most right now. Oh, absolutely. I, I think uh, uh, when, when you talk about credit, the first challenge always is identity verification. Who are you giving money to, right? Identif uh, and then uh, we always talk about fraud prevention. Uh, across various industries, there's a huge fraud loss that all of us would like to bring down. And uh, all of this, and then you can talk about early warning signals from a lender's perspective. Uh, from a very credit risk perspective, there's so much to do on portfolio management. Invariably, it, it all comes down to large and disparate data sets, huge volumes to be processed quickly. And uh, we all know the potential, the risk, et cetera. Uh, I, I think what I would like to take a minute really about is as we go towards the strategy document, it, it's really about, uh, we often talk about when are we going to get the usage of AI in scale in the financial services sector. We talk about a lot of POCs, but when is it really going to be uh, used in scale? And I think as we talk about the strategy and the vision document, it's absolutely important to define a roadmap with uh, uh, well-defined in incrementalism, right? When we talk about AI in a regulated environment in particular, there's always this uh, apprehension about is there enough explainability, 
right? And I, I think uh, we can get there. It's really about incrementalism. We have enough champion challenges. Start using it and, and keep growing in confidence. And, and we've gone through the journey before. When we started using data and analytics and scorecards in the past versus the human touch and the, you know, the uh, old ways of uh, paper-based credit, etc. So it's just a natural journey. I, I think uh, a well-defined incremental approach should take us there in terms of realizing all the uh, potential benefits and controlling the risks. So Depeche, in terms of Gift City, right, I, I know any, any measure of success for, for a, a center like that is going to be your, your ability to control any financial crime and things like that. I mean, are you seeing AI being useful, uh, a, a valid tool yet for for as you plan your development going into the future? I can only say that after hearing my fellow panelists, I can say that as a regulator, probably we just came out with a uh, regulation which talks of financial crime compliance services within the IFFC ecosystem now. So we, are, we have just brought a regulation which allows a lot of expertise on financial crime compliance services, which can be now housed within GIFT, which can be provided from that zone. But to answer to the question that you are saying as a regulator, I think what we are seeing is the institutions are becoming smarter and smarter every day with the use of technology. I think as a regulator, sometimes you feel that you are getting in, in, in to catch up that speed. One has to, you know, uh, catch up to the technology, the way that it has been used by so many institutions. Uh, but for us, I think what has been the advantage is been the new regulator into the system. Learning from other regulators has been an advantage to see how they have evolved and what were the practices which has worked for them or which has not worked for them. And we could now clearly see that the at the stage of the application, if you are able to apply most of the uh, checks and balances, that's the time that you are able to filter a lot of applicants from where you can actually go potentially wrong versus what are likely to be your most you know, type of a, uh, institutions which will be working within the four corners of the regulatory environments. Oh, that's great. So I know our, our time is just about up, so I'll, so I'll end hopefully quickly. Maybe I'll go around the horn here, but you know, thinking about the strategy document, if you were to pick one thing that, that you'd like to see out of that document, what would it, what would it be? Maybe I'll start over, over here. Yeah. Uh, I, for, for us, I think we believe uh, it, it has to be scaling and, uh, and train people to leverage uh, you know, this powerhouse of technology. Level playing field, ease of doing business. Uh, yeah, I, I think again from a credit perspective, uh, connecting all the dots in terms of the digital public infrastructures and the data, digital public goods so that uh, the Indian citizen can represent himself or herself very well to avail the best for, for themselves and empower themselves, which should contribute towards our strategy and, and getting to the vision of uh, 2047. I would say skill development in the several areas, which is going to be very critical. The way the India has to deliver, it has to build the skills now. That's great. I think from my perspective, I liked what, I believe it was Minister Singh from the cloud security uh, panel earlier that said, uh, innovation first, regulation to balance that. And I think whatever initiatives are in place, we can encourage that uh, at this time uh, for India. I think it'll be hugely important for the development of the financial sector. So. With that said, I know we've got a couple left uh, after us, so thank you very much to our panelists. Uh, it was a great discussion, and looking forward to continuing our, our partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much, but before that, before uh, I would request all of you to please uh, remain seated. Uh, I would, uh, you know, we have concluding remarks for this session, and uh, for that I would, uh, Call upon Rita Jo Lewis to please deliver the concluding remarks for this session and uh, the discussions that we had. Uh, Ms. Lewis has been a trailblazer in facilitating U.S. exports, uh, creating jobs and strengthening American competitiveness globally. Her vision for the financial sector will shed light on the strategic moves both nations need to take to ensure a robust and resilient financial future. Uh, calling Ms. Rita Jo Lewis, President and Chair of the Export-Import Bank of the United States for the concluding remarks of this session. Thank you. Can I have a round of applause? Thank you so much. Well, what a group. What a group. I will tell you, Ambassador, uh, this has been 
an excellent opportunity for us at XM Bank to be here uh, at this great occasion of the U.S. Chamber's meeting here in, um, in New Delhi. I told the ambassador I was going to be his warm-up act. And he told me, no, I'm going to be your closing act. <laughs> so I've known the ambassador a very long time, so I know you all are waiting with bating breath to hear what he has to say. But um, your chairman and I, uh, Mr. Knight, uh, was together in Switzerland uh, earlier this year, and he reminded me that as dinner guests, we were able to talk about this meeting and whether I would be able to come. And I said, absolutely, invite me, I will come. You know, when I look out in the audience and I see uh, our United States governor from Iowa, let's give her a great round of applause about all the jo great job she's doing. I say that because I spent several years at the Department of State working with governors uh, and mayors and local officials, and so I have such a deep appreciation for the work that they do and how they are driving uh, their economy. So, uh, Governor Reynolds, it's good to see you and your team. I know you have a big delegation. You're going to have an exciting visit here. You know, as I was listening to the plans that this panel before me spoke about, it really gave me um, a lot to kind of think about as we have been on this journey for the last several years. I know you all talked about five years, but we've been talking about this for th several years, about the work of XM Bank, not just XM Bank being back, but XM Bank delivering results. And so I know you have had so many of our U U United States government colleagues here. Uh, I just saw Nisha from DFC just leaving. We just, we work a lot together, Scott and I. And when I see Department of Commerce, USAID's, select USA officials, our assistant secretary, and of course the NSC team here, it really tells me that we are embodying what Vice President Harris and President Biden has asked us to do, is to work in a whole of government. Because we all know that one government agency, one city, one state, one national government, can, and one private sector, one nonprofit, one trade association cannot do it alone to meet the challenges that we're all going to be facing, that we've been discussing this week, that it is going to take partnerships and collaborations for us to be able to do the work uh, that we need to do for our companies to stay not just competitive, but to be not and not just to compete, we need you to win. So when I heard about your theme about partnerships and prosperity in the area of AI and critical technologies, it could not be more appropriate to meet the moments of today's challenges. I could also not be more excited when I speak with your, the ambassador in India and the ambassador here in, in our ambassador here in India, their ambassador in, uh, in the United States to really see that over 163 Indian companies with operations in the U.S. are now employing over a little less than 4.3 million Americans and investing, Indian companies have invested nearly 40 billion to our U.S. economy. I mean, those numbers are huge and they are truly impactful and meaningful for the daily lives of any American citizen that is in being employed, especially in the industries that you are creating each and every day. You know, one of the things that we at XM uh, wanted to leave in the visit that we have had is about how we are ready to support not only in the U.S., the Indian government in the work that we're doing together, but to support any of you in whatever ways that we can. As we have participated in this summit over the last few days, we've had some very, very great discussions around job creation, skilling and promoting investments in both of our countries. And it is wonderful together with all of you, the top US and Indian companies that we've been meeting with and business leaders and government leaders to accelerate the most ambitious course charted by the United States and India. And so we say that is what is at the heart of what XM is all about. We're hopeful that we can continue deepening our, be a part of continuing to deepen our US and India policy alignments. And this includes working together on issues like telecommunication, energy security, AI, techno biotechnology, and beyond. 
At XM, we recognize that the strategic convergence of U.S. and Indian technology and innovation is playing when it comes to the role defining and shaping our relationship. We know that this has been a summit that has been about emphasizing how we continue to build and strengthen the U.S.-India relationship because it is such a bright and shining star uh, that we all are following. We know together we can work together as we explore how our partnership can propel our shared economic potential to transform digital health, unlock clean energy, secure our defense, and a free Indo-Pacific all bolstered by our shared values of democracy and the rule of law. You know, this summit has been a powerful demonstration of our country's shared trust in one another. So let me be clear that the U.S. and XM, despite the global rise of undemocratic forces, our societies remain high trust, unwavering democratic, and committed to free enterprise. Over the years, XM has equipped American exporters with the financing tools necessary to compete for global sales. So whether it has been small or medium sized or large businesses, we know that all of our comp uh, uh, all need protection from commercial or political risks. We know that all sometimes have need the access to cash flows, or we want to also know and help with those who need credit terms where we can cover them. You know, we're proud to support exporters uh, to win more sales and grow more businesses overseas as possible. And that's what we have been championing now for over 90 years, and that's what both of our countries have been doing. But we know that now, more than ever, we need to work together to make progress on how to further advance the progress we have already made. It is no secret that the strategic convergence of U.S. and Indian technology and innovation is playing as a defining role in shaping the relationship between the world's two oldest and largest democracies. And so here at this summit, this India Ideas Summit, we have been excited to join with my team here from XM. We have Dan uh, in the back, who is our vice president for uh, project and structured finance, and Ashok, who is our managing director in our energy and our environmental and engineering program. And we have um, John, who has really been working tirelessly with all of the different org organizations that we have been before of regarding global business development. Because as we leave here, we need to let you know we want to continue to, to, for those of you who do not know us and for those of you who do, to make sure that you know you have the continued connectedness connectedness to us that you will need as you move your projects forward. Now, XM Bank, as you most of you know, is an institution that between 2014 and 2019 had an opportunity when we were out of the market and did not have a quorum. And so some of our companies, you know, they left, they had to, you know, to take care of business and they left and they went off to work with other ECAs. And then when 2019 came roaring back and the U.S. Congress authorized uh, XM, XM for the longest authorization that we have ever had in the history of XM. It was seven years up until 2026. Shortly thereafter, COVID hit. So therefore, being out of the market for the time when we did not have a quorum and the time when COVID hit and everyone was home, it really saw us hit a very rough patch. But I am here to tell you that in the two and a half years that I have served in the administration, working with President Biden, working with Vice President Harris, is that, as I said, not only are we back, we are delivering results. And the results have, have shown itself in, I will tell you, that every time the President has traveled, whether it's the G7, the G20, the Indo-Pacific summits, the, the, the ASEAN region, or whether he is traveling with APAC, you name it. And when he, he has asked, XM has delivered what we call, you all know in the U.S. government, a deliverable. Because you know, if you're not de de uh, giving a deliverable, it's like, why are you even in existence? 
because that is what really continues to shore you up in the ability for you to have a seat at the table because as Jake Sullivan has said, who is our national security advisor, that economic security is now national security. And national security is economic security. So for the very first time, organizations like ours, DFC and others, the economic driver uh, agencies have a seat at the national security table with meetings that's called by him. Why is that so? We are all facing some, some great challenges and some uncertain times, and we know that we need to use every tool in the U.S. governors, in the U.S. government's arsenal and in our toolkit in order for us to just stay competitive. But we don't want to stay competitive. We've got to begin to do what America has always done, is to outdistance the competition. So it doesn't matter whether we're trying to transform digital health or, or whether we're trying to unlock all of the clean energy technologies, we know that we need tools every day uh, in order to do that, and we need financing tools. You know, this year, in February, Exim Bank turned 90 years old. I had the opportunity to visit the home of Franklin Dela, our former president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I went to the Presidential Library and Museum in Hyde Park where I was able to tour the grounds and was hosted for a fireside chat with FDR's great granddaughter, Sarah Bottinger, who serves on XM Advisory Committee for over two years. We had the opportunity to discuss how XM is continuing to implement the same ideals that this agency was founded on, a simple mission, facilitate exports and support U.S. jobs. And so I know many of you have heard me say and heard us all say, it's not just about jobs in the United States. We have to always be talking about the jobs in the country of which we are dealing with. Because at the end of the day, it is the job creation. It is, all, it is about the job creation that propels all of us to prosperity. So we have been able to um, not only see how we found it, but know that the work that we're doing in the Biden administration, we are still embodying the same principle that our, we were founded upon as we strive to empower exporters as they compete and as they win and build new global ties that shapes our future. So I know that with our team and partners here, especially in this embassy, with our great Ambassador Garcetti, we are working hard to uphold the legacy by striving to empower all of you uh, as you continue to build global ties. Now, we're a small agency. We have a little less than about 100. We have about a little less than about 400 employees. But Congress awarded us one of our largest lending caps of $135 billion. We have spent about $35 billion, and in the last two and a half years in the Biden administration, we've done about $25 billion. We are on tap between now and September 30th to, to have what we hope is a very strong clo closing. Now, most of folks, they, they understand or they hear about the large deals that happen at XM, but they don't realize that of that 8.8 .8 that we did last year, $2 billion of that was in small business because not only how important that is, it is important in every country that we have gone in. Matter of fact, right before this meeting, we were meeting with the Minister Das in the Small Business Ministry and talking about not small business just for small business sakes, but looking at what's happening in rural communities, what's happening in veteran communities, what's happening with LGBTQ communities, and more importantly, what's happening in the underserved communities, minority communities, and more importantly, what's happening with women entrepreneurs. Because we know that those businesses are growing two and four times faster than the average business. And in this administration that we are so fortunate to serve in, we value small business because we know it is the backbone of every one of our states and territories economy. So we are important, it is important to be able to, to stand before you to also say that as we have crossed a number of these milestones, whether it is in meeting our goals because we're very data driven about what we have to do, about the fact that we have, because we are meeting our numbers, because we are having, I believe, the kind of product, 
productive impact as we have worked with all of you, whether we're out distancing ourselves and in, in authorizing some of the largest renewable deals in the history of XM, just most recently doing one with companies um, in Angola. Uh, for about 950 million for a renewable energy deal. Uh, we also uh, are introducing new products that is we hope will be there to assist all of you uh, in the work that you're doing and make it much more flexible and much more attractive to use XM financing. And we are continuing to live up to the mandate, the, that Cong the additional mandates that Congress has asked us to, to make more financing available in small business, to make more financing uh, available in the transformational export area, to make more financing available in renewable energy and energy storage, and to make more financing available in sub-Saharan Africa. Africa. And so as we look to go up for early reauthorization, the U.S. Chamber and all of many of you have been major supporters of ours and we look to continue to work with you because we have gotten such strong indication in the House and the Senate from Senator Coons and Congressman Luke DeMeyer and, and Ranking Member Beatty that they are very encouraged about the support of XM Bank for early reauthorization. So I just want to end by saying we know that we are sitting in a country where President Biden has said this is one of the most consequential relationships that's happening between U.S. and India. And we at XM want to make sure that we do our part to help and to assist and to support and strengthen and deepen the overall bilateral relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that wonderful uh, concluding remark and of course the comprehensive discussion before that on the future of the financial sector and how it will impact the US-India economic partnership. Thank you very much. Um, Rita Jo Lewis, Dr. Deepesh Shah, Alex Muzaski, Bishakha Bhattacharya, Rajesh Kumar and R.G. Manalak. Thank you very much for the panel discussion. Ambassador Keshav too uh, on stage as we huddle for a photograph. Thank you, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much. Sure. Moving on, we now have a keynote by Mr. Jitin Prasada, the Honorable Minister of State for Commerce and Industry and Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India. I would like to welcome Mr. Prasada. Jitin Prasad has been instrumental in shaping India's policies in trade, commerce, and technology, guiding the nation's digital transformation and enhancing India's position as a global trade hub. I would like to call upon Jyoti Pawar, General Counsel at Microsoft India to formally introduce the minister and invite him up on stage. I would also like to invite Ambassador Keshap, President of USIBC, Mr. Rahul Sharma, Managing Director of USIBC on stage for this keynote as well. Yes, I think all of you can come up. Ms. Jyoti Pawar will introduce him formally and then we will invite the minister for the keynote address. Should we start? Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, and distinguished guests. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker today a dynamic leader who is playing a crucial role in India's technological advancement, the Honorable Minister of State for Electronics and Information Technology and Commerce and Industry, Sri Jitin Prasad. His journey is one of dedication, adaptability, and above all, a deep commitment to India's progress. His political career, spanning nearly two decades, has been marked by significant milestones, from being one of the youngest union ministers in 2008 to his 
current pivotal role in shaping India's tech policies, Minister Prasad has consistently demonstrated his ability to evolve with the changing needs of our nation. Throughout his political career, he has served the country in various ministerial capacities, including portfolios like steel, road and transport, HRD, technical education, etc., showcasing his versatility and commitment to national development. As India continues to position itself as a digital superpower, his role in shaping our country's policies in commerce, industry, and technology couldn't come at a more critical time. Under his leadership, the Ministry of Commerce is taking proactive measures to promote ease of doing business in India by streamlining processes and removing regulatory barriers. One of the notable initiatives include the Regulatory Compliance Burden Booklet, which illustrates government measures to streamline process, uh, embrace digitization, and remove regulatory barriers to enhance business efficiency. India is also revising free trade agreements with South Korea, Malaysia, and various other ASEAN countries, and the Honorable Minister is spearheading those discussions as well. He, has a strong he is and has been a strong advocate for advancing India's role in the field of AI, emphasizing the importance of democratizing its benefits in an ethical and responsible manner. His dedication to fostering an inclusive and robust AI ecosystem through skills development and significant investment in nurturing AI startups reflects a vision that resonates deeply with many of us here today. Beyond his official duties, he has been involved in social welfare initiatives through the Jitendra Prasad Foundation, organizing health camps and empowerment programs in Uttar Pradesh. His work has also contributed to establishing healthcare infrastructure across UP. His visionary leadership, coupled with his multifaceted experience and strategic focus on technology, infrastructure, education, and inclusive development, not only aligns with India's aspirations, but also paves the way for enhancing India's global competitiveness and holistic progress. We welcome you, sir, to the USIBC IDEA Summit and look forward to your insights on India's evolving role in the global technology and business landscape. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Jyoti, for the introduction, which was very illustrious, and I don't know if I'm worthy of that, but thank you anyway. So uh, I'm very glad that I'm here on this uh, Summit of India Idea Summit, and uh, I've just uh, taken over the ministry responsibility for information technology and, and commerce three months back, and uh, I think it's safe enough for me to stick to the prepared text. <laughs> <laughs> so, honorable dignitaries, esteemed guests and friends, I'm honored to address this distinguished gathering at the India Idea Summit, organized by the US India Business Council. This summit symbolizes the robust partnership between India and the United States. I stand here today to reflect on the technological cooperation and digital economy priorities reshaping the global economic landscape. We are witnessing an era of unprecedented global shifts the geopolitical dynamics, supply chain disruptions, and rapid technological advancements have redefined the contours of global trade and cooperation. The global economy is in a flux. There's uncertainty, but also opportunity. Supply chains are being reimagined. Technology is evolving at breakneck speed, and markets are shifting. Amongst all of this, India has been resilient, standing tall, we faced challenges, but our growth rate tells the story of an economy on the move, driven by innovation, strategic reforms, and an unstoppable digital push. India, with its diverse market and skilled workforce, is just not adapting, but thriving in the new order. 
India under the visionary leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji has been unwavering in its commitment to the Viksad Bharat, a prosperous developed India. This transformation is taking place in a world where technology is no longer a mere enabler, but a core driver of economic growth. Digitalization, artificial intelligence, and frontier technologies have changed the way we perceive economies, transforming traditional industries and giving rise to new sectors. India has positioned itself as a key player in the digital revolution. Our commitment to being a trillion dollar digital economy by 2025 reflects the vision of a future where technology is interwoven with every fabric of our society, creating jobs, improving healthcare, ensuring financial inclusion, and promoting sustainable development. India champions diplomatic cooperation through multi -forum, multilateral forums like Quad and G20. These platforms are instrumental in shaping the future of global governance, and technology-driven diplomacy will be key in ensuring a stable, inclusive, and equitable world order. And at the heart of this transformation is the collaboration between India and the United States. We share more than just strong economic ties. We are connected by common values, democracy, freedom, innovation, and a drive to push boundaries. What excites me most is how these values translate into the digital space, where the real magic of our partnership lies. The digital economy is a cornerstone of this collaboration. Together, we have the opportunity to build a technology bridge that only not serves our bilateral interests, but also addresses the global challenges. Our flagship initiatives like the Digital India, Startup India, Make in India have set the stage for global companies to invest and co-create solutions that address both domestic and global challenges. From AI to blockchain, from quantum computing to 5G, our cooperation in these cutting-edge technologies can drive productivity, enhance cyber security, and pave the way for sustainable development. Moreover, digital connectivity and access to emerging technologies can uplift the marginalized and bring millions into the fold of economic opportunity. Additionally, India's aspirations for a renewable energy future resonate with global sustainability goals, Green hydrogen, solar energy, and electric mobility are areas where India and the U.S. can co-create solutions to reduce carbon emissions and address climate challenges. As we approach the centenary of India's independence in 2047, we envision a Viksit Bharat developed nation with robust infrastructure, a vibrant economy, and a technologically advanced society. This vision is rooted in inclusive growth, where no citizen is left behind, and where innovation drives socioeconomic progress. India's journey towards a digital first economy is driven by initiatives like Digital India, where we've seen remarkable success in bringing internet access to the masses and delivering public services efficiently. The government's focus on building a strong digital infrastructure has empowered millions of entrepreneurs, especially in the rural areas, who are now using e-commerce platforms to sell their products globally. This democratization of technology is what, we will, is what will fuel the next phase of India's growth. However, this transformation cannot be achieved in isolation. Technology cooperation, with the United States can help us leapfrog in areas such as AI, data science, and automation. U.S. companies are investing in India not just for business gains, but to participate in our digital journey. The recent partnership between American technology giants and Indian startups underscores the synergies that exist between our two nations. To further this, we must focus on three areas, innovation, skill development, and a regulatory alignment. Innovation 
which is the bedrock of economic progress. The U.S. has been at the forefront of technological breakthroughs, and India is fast emerging as an innovation hub. Our startup ecosystem, now the third largest in the world, is producing disruptive ideas that are solving real-world problems by fostering greater cooperation between our innovation ecosystems we can create solutions not only that benefit our economies, but also at the world stage. One of the key areas where we see significant potential for cooperation between India and the United States is the world, is a field of artificial intelligence. AI has the power to transform every aspect of our lives, from healthcare and education to agriculture and manufacturing. India, with its India AI mission, is already making significant strides in this area with a thriving AI ecosystem and a commitment to harnessing AI for social good. We must encourage joint research and development, expand the scope of our bilateral initiatives, and explore collaboration in all emerging and sunrise sectors. Skill development. As we navigate through this technological era, we must prepare our workforce for challenges and opportunities it brings. Skill development is a crucial for harnessing benefits of our new technologies. With over 65% of India's population at the age of 35, under 35, India has a demographic advantage that only a few countries can match. However, to fully realize this potential, we must invest in upskilling and reskilling our workforce. Here again, the US-India collaboration can play a transformative role. American universities and companies can partner with Indian institutions to offer cutting-edge training programs in the field of AI, data science, and robotics. Similarly, Indian tech talent can contribute in solving complex problems for the U.S. companies, creating a win-win scenario. The regulatory alignment. The digital economy thrives of innovation, but it also needs a conducive regulatory environment to grow sustainably. Both India and the U.S. recognize the importance of balancing innovation with responsible governance. As we deepen our cooperation in digital technologies, it is essential to align our regulatory framework to facilitate cross-border data flows, ensure cybersecurity, and protect consumer rights. India's recent data protection initiatives along with its robust cybersecurity framework, demonstrate our commitment to creating a safe and secure digital environment. We look forward to working with our U.S. counterparts to harmonize regulations in areas such as AI ethics, IPRs, and digital trade. It is essential that we seize this opportunity to establish frameworks that promote responsible innovation and shared prosperity. The road ahead. What excites me is how technology will open doors for millions of people, offering opportunities that simply don't exist before. Whether it is the farmers in India accessing real-time market data or a U.S. company finding groundbreaking solutions through collaborations with Indian engineers, this is where our partnership makes a real difference. As we conclude this summit, I'm sure you'll be very happy after this day, this busy day. It is clear that the India-US partnership is at a critical juncture. The future of our economy is intimately linked with our ability to embrace and lead in the digital space. By working together, we can create a digital economy that is inclusive, resilient, and sustainable, one that benefits not just us, but nations, but the entire world. I'm pleased to note that the US-India Business Council has been working tirelessly to promote cooperation between our two countries. Your efforts to bring together business leaders, policy makers, and thought leaders from both sides of the Pacific are helping to build a strong foundation for a more prosperous and sustainable future. India is committed to being a reliable partner in this journey, and I'm confident that through our continued collaboration, we will achieve new heights in technology, innovation, and economic growth. And yesterday only, we just had uh, one of uh, our semiconductor conferences where 
from the whole world we saw participation and all uh, sectors from research to testing to to design to manufacturing had assembled there and the prime minister was there himself and he is himself uh, giving that push to the semiconductor industry where india would play a leading role and he has emphasized that india will focus on uh, manufacturing making whatever technology in the digital space more inclusive so that it reaches out to the last mile also that uh, the compliance burdens will be reduced so we don't get mired down in 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 the in the compliances and uh, and the and the other one which we would want to focus is on innovation and i'm sure us will be playing a great role and india can be since these technologies have huge investments and need a lot of commitment passion and trust so i can say with great certainty that india will be that trusted partner of the united states to take this mission forward and i hope that uh, we both countries india and the united states will work together and strengthen the mission to bring technology to the people so that we can transform their lives for the better thank you thank you very much honorable minister for your address on the future of india's trade and technology landscape uh, i i think uh, i can request all of you to uh, huddle for a photograph sorry a proposed vote of thanks for the minister <laughs> all right photograph first and then the vote of thanks all right Thank you so much and now Mr Rahul Sharma is going to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you. Very quickly, uh thank you Mr Minister. You've been in your new job for 3 months so you chose to read the speech. I've been in this job for 3 weeks. I have no other option but to read mine too. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. But I'll keep this aside. Thank you. I just wanted to say uh it was wonderful to have you here. Wonderful to hear your thoughts. Digital space is a big thing for everybody at USIBC we have lots and lots of members many of them whom you know uh there's a lot of interesting things we are doing including being part of the AI mission uh, we have an AI task force we had a great meeting this morning to discuss a lot of new things and of course technology is an area where most of our members many of our members practically every of our members is some of the other involved in so thank you once again uh pleasure to have you i think we have the ambassador now Right. Okay. Thank you very much. I think uh, Ambassador Keshav uh, would you like to present a, a bouquet to the honorable minister <laughs> All right Thank you very much for taking out the time to come here and address the audience honorable minister thank you very much I request you to please take your seats